I'm Shelley Frazier Mickle. I've been writing books for 50 years, and this one, Borrowing Life, is different. It is history, it is nonfiction, and well, I'm actually jealous of my readers because in these pages, you will meet for the first time the extraordinary men and women of the greatest generation who made one of the most valuable contributions to humankind in the 20th century. When I began awakening this story from history, I was actually bombarded with fat slices of wonder because the story brings back America during World War II when personal courage, sacrifice, and a search for goodness was an everyday obsession. After Pearl Harbor, every medical student in America was drafted. Among these was Joe Murray, 25 years old, in Boston with only nine months of surgical training. He was assigned to the largest military hospital to wait for overseas duty. There in January 1945, a burned pilot arrived. He was so horribly injured that he had only hours to live. In a Hail Mary attempt to save his life, skin was borrowed from a cadaver to graft over his wounds. When those skin grafts were not rejected as usual in 10 to 14 days, Joe Murray knew he had witnessed a scientific phenomenon, and he asked the question, why not also borrow organs to save a life? Add this to the fascinating story of crush syndrome. When victims were dug out of the rubble in the London bombings, their kidneys were so damaged death was near, yet if they could be kept alive for several weeks, their kidneys often spontaneously began working. Now get this amazing fact. In Nazi Holland, a young physician invented the first dialysis machine out of sausage casings and tomato cans. With this invention, the idea of transplanting a kidney from one to another moved from fantasy to possibility, promising to save thousands of lives. Yes, borrowing life is not just a dramatic story. It is the kind of story that changes those who read it, and I might add the one who wrote it. To be in the presence of those who dedicated their lives to preserving life in the midst of war and even share new treatments across borders is, well, as I said, I'm jealous of those who get to meet for the first time these extraordinary scientists, surgeons, and war heroes who changed the world for the better. I found long ago that the best measure of a book is whether or not you are the same person after you turn the last page. I'll be eager to hear from you when you've turned the last page of Borrowing Life. The five and a half hour surgery of the first successful kidney transplant has been memorialized in this painting by Joel Babb. It hangs in the Harvard Medical School Countway Library next to the famous painting of the first surgery performed with ether. It is that important. This history begins with Charles Woods and part of what makes it so very touching is that Borrowing Life contains four captivating love stories. Charles grew up in an orphanage in Alabama during the Great Depression. His passion to fly held him together. He joined the United States Air Force after Pearl Harbor, but the signature moment in his life was when he met an 18-year-old girl named Miriam Wilkes. They married and had a young son when Charles was assigned to fly the hump, one of the most dangerous missions in the war. To help the Chinese defend against Japan, flying the hump meant delivering aviation fuel over the Himalayan mountains every 24 hours. The mission was so dangerous, no pilot expected to live more than 30 days. Every 90 days, 100% of the planes were lost. But as usual, like most of us at the age of 22, Charles felt invincible. He said that when he was told to fly, he flew. On December 23, 1944, he was taking off at an air base in India. He removed his gloves and helmet, as most aviators did to give more dexterity and vision. He said his usual prayer and pushed the engines to the 120 mile an hour speed to lift from the runway. But the plane failed to become airborne. With its 28,000 gallons of fuel, it crashed and exploded. Ordinarily, someone burned as severely would live only a few minutes, but Charles was different and lucky. He was determined to get back to Miriam and his young son, and also to live with purpose. 
He began holding on to his life with a ferocious grip, refusing to let go. The threat of his dying from dehydration and infection meant the plane ride back to the States was a grueling six weeks. After stopping every other day to rest in a hospital, first in Calcutta, then Iraq, Egypt, Casablanca, and finally Iceland, he arrived at the military hospital in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. By then, he had used up his strength and was holding on to his life by a sheer thread. Joe Murray was assigned as a member of the medical team to try to save him, and when he walked into the room to meet Charles, he saw a man with no face and almost no hands, only hours from dying. Joe Murray was the grandson of immigrants who thought that getting into America was a lucky charm, and it should never be tarnished with pessimism. They practiced cheer as an everyday expression of their good luck, and they encouraged Joe to get the best education America offered. Joe was given extraordinary traits by both inheritance and hard work. He grew up in Mitford, Massachusetts, and graduated from high school at the top of his class. He decided as a child he wanted to be a surgeon. He wanted to lead a purposeful life like his beloved family doctor who treated all their ailments and restored good health. Joe read books about surgeons, about family doctors, about those who prepared themselves with the best educations. He set his sights on going to Harvard Medical School, but first he wanted to indulge his love for the arts. At Holy Cross College, he spent four years memorizing poetry and reading literature. He knew that once he got to medical school, he would be immersed in science. In 1940, he entered Harvard Medical School, and here's what made Joe different. He had an unquenchable curiosity, and he was beautifully stubborn. He would grab hold of a problem and shake it relentlessly until the answers fell out. He applied his sunny disposition to revering life in all forms. He'd pry an insect from a window screen and flick it outside rather than squash it. He loved music and married Bobby Link, nicknamed Bobby for her singing voice that was as charming as the bird known as Bobba Link. When Joe began training in surgery, a remarkable quirk of nature distinguished him. He was born left-handed. But since his teachers insisted he learned to write with his right hand, he was ambidextrous in the operating room. He could solve problems of anatomy without walking around the operating table, saving the patient more time under anesthesia. He was quick, methodical, yet flexible in solving unexpected complications, and he was, above all, compassionate. That January of 1945, when he first saw Charles Woods, he knew there was nowhere on Charles's burn body to harvest skin to cover his wounds. Something new would have to be tried. Fluids were leaking from Charles's wounds, and his only weapon against infection was the new drug, penicillin, which fortunately was in ready supply since millions of doses had been prepared for D-Day. In a Hail Mary attempt to save Charles's life, Joe and the team of doctors took skin from a cadaver, even though they knew those grafts would not last. Research had shown that the only skin grafts that bypassed rejection were those between identical twins. But when Charles's cadaver skin grafts lasted nearly a month, Joe knew he had witnessed a scientific phenomenon that ignited his curiosity about organ transplantation, which many said was a crazy idea. He was warned that if he got involved with that wild idea of transplanting a kidney, he would ruin his career. He ignored those warnings. His curiosity and belief in science was stronger than any criticism. Years later, when more was known about the immune system, Joe surmised that Charles's grafts lasted because his immune system was too weak to destroy them. Joe needed a fellow surgeon to clear the way, someone to balance out his gentle nature someone who was willing to buck traditional thinking to move the idea of transplanting organs from fantasy to reality. Enter Francis Daniels Moore. He was from the Midwest, privileged, wealthy, intelligent, with no reason to do anything in life other than to sit back and enjoy it. But Francis Moore, called Franny, was one of those people who pursue excellence for its own sake. He didn't need money. He didn't want fame. He certainly didn't need to prove himself. He simply thrived on excellence. 
Even his secretary said that Dr. Moore lived life on a different plane. He was the youngest surgeon to ever be named the Mosley Professor of Surgery at Harvard, and the medical treatments he advanced affect everyone today who walks through a hospital door. He is one of the most important surgeons in American history. He put in place at the Peter Bent Brigham Hospital in Boston the most renowned center for the treatment of kidney disease using the dialysis machine invented during the war. When Joe Murray was discharged from the Army, he finished his training under Franny and eventually specialized in plastic surgery. His love for plastic surgery grew from his experience in giving Charles Woods a face and a pair of hands with which he would walk out and do the world. Joe always wondered if he would have the courage of Charles Woods, and Charles's story is indeed extraordinary. He returned to his home state of Alabama, and when his high school buddy suggested he collect his pension and sit on his porch and raise turkeys or, well, something like that, he said, I didn't work this hard to stay alive to just sit on the porch. He bought television stations at the dawn of TV. He eventually ran for governor against George Wallace and for president in 1992. You can see interviews with him on YouTube and also the disturbing comments easily listed in our digital culture Reactions from those who thrive on making snarky comments with little understanding. Charles lived a long, productive life. He died at the grand old age of 83 and is buried in Arlington Cemetery. Francis Moore recognized that to pioneer the first successful organ transplant, he needed extraordinary scientists. He also knew that the first transplant should be a kidney. It was fist-sized, attached to arteries that would be easy to suture to a donated kidney, and besides, kidneys came in twos, so normally there would be a spare. While Joe and Franny knew that a kidney transplanted from one identical twin to another would bypass rejection, the secrets of that biology needed to be understood. In Britain, those exact answers were being unveiled by Peter Medawar. At the age of 20, he met Jean, a fellow student at Oxford. Everyone knew he was brilliant beyond comprehension. Jean called him an uncut diamond packed with light and fire. They married two days before Peter's 22nd birthday, and their love story is certainly one you will want to read. Peter Brian Medawar, how can we even grasp the whole of who he was? Many of his colleagues compared him to Galileo for what he discovered about biology and the workings of the immune system. He was a zoology graduate student and the father of a young daughter when a Spitfire plane flew over his neighborhood during the bombing of London and crashed. With his other neighbors, he ran to help the pilot who was horribly burned. Physicians caring for the pilot begged Medawar to apply his brilliant mind to finding a way to make skin grafts last, to bypass rejection, and save the lives of so many other victims of war. Afterward, Medawar wrote that every scientist who wants to do something original and important must suffer some shock to focus his mind, to set him on the pleasure of discovery. I won't go into the elegant experiments Medawar designed and carried out because they are explained in my book, Borrowing Life, and none of us wants the joy of reading, especially the communion with the printed word on the pages of a book, to disappear in this digital age. So I'll leave that special pleasure to you, which has been called a glorious fever caught from the desire to know. Personally, I always like to remember to read something that will make me look good if I die in the middle of it. As for Peter Medawar, his magnificent science led to immortality when in 1960, at only the age of 45, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for establishing the new field of immunogenetics, becoming known as the father of immunology. His discoveries are part of what today encourages using the immune system to treat cancer. Now here is a fun irony. Exactly 10 years after the day that Charles Woods' plane crashed, December 23, 1944, Joe performed the first successful kidney transplant at the Peter Bent Brigham Hospital. It was December 23, 1954, when he placed a donated kidney from Ronald Herrick into his dying identical twin brother Richard. Both were veterans of the Korean War. I'll leave the drama of that intense surgery for you to discover in the pages of Borrowing Life. 
In time, with his characteristic humility, Joe called the transplantation of organs spare part surgery or borrowing life, which in no way belittled the ultimate gift of retrieving life for one so close to losing it. In 1990, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine, only the fourth surgeon to be recognized with that distinction. He lived to the grand old age of 93, having given the means to preserving life to thousands around the world and many every day. He always loved the saying that work should be a wordless prayer. Through another eight years, Joe helped establish the use of immunosuppression drugs to break the barrier of rejection so that today organ transplants seem a matter of course as well as an everyday miracle. Yet the science and the skill of those who fought every obstacle to move organ transplants from myth to reality should never be merely a footnote or a comment in the margins. Indeed, it is uplifting to realize what can be achieved when you aim your talents and energy to benefiting someone else's life. As I say in the opening of Borrowing Life, this story of the first successful organ transplant is not quite a fairy tale, but it is close. The main difference is that the villain is not human, it's death. And this is the story of those who fought the good fight and won. I hope you will enjoy reading Borrowing Life. Writing it has been a privilege.